Welcome to Washed by the Word. I'm Pastor Khan, and I wanted to personally welcome you to our Sunday morning service as we go verse by verse through God's Word. It's our desire here by Washed by the Word that the Spirit of God will speak to you intimately as we go verse by verse through His Word. So welcome again to our Sunday morning service, and I look forward to hearing from all of you sharing with us what God has shown you today as you get washed by the Word. First Samuel chapter 25. Uh, for those of you that are new here, what um, we've been doing is walking through the life of David. Oftentimes in our studies, we cover just a few verses at a time. Our Thursday night study, we covered two verses last Thursday. And the week before, two verses. So we'll be in Revelation for about another 12 years or so. So we're going very slow through the book of Revelation. That's on Thursday nights. At 7 on Sunday mornings, we're going through 1 Samuel, and we're covering one or two chapters a week. So we pick up the pace on Sunday mornings. Uh, what we've been looking at right now is David. We've seen his life come from being that shepherd boy, remember, outside of Bethlehem, when the prophet Samuel came and uh, anointed him the next king of Israel. The issue was, uh, Saul was still king of Israel. And we looked at the life of Saul. We saw how Saul had been anointed king of Israel. All the potential in the world, but uh, we looked at his mistakes there in chapters 13, 14, and 15 of 1 Samuel and saw how the kingdom was taken from Saul. But he was not so quick to give it up. And now there is this cat and mouse game going on between Saul and David. We saw Saul put a hit out on David. Then we saw Saul get very open in his aggression towards David, actually grabbing the military and now hunting David. While that was going on, we saw last week David confronted with a major test. And that was, remember in chapter 24, Saul and his men are down in En Gedi. Those of you that went to Israel with us in the past, remember that's that o this oasis area near the Dead Sea. And while David and his men were hiding in En Gedi, here comes Saul with his army. So David and his men scurry into one of the many caves found there in En Gedi. And we're going to look at that in a little bit here, but the Jews used caves for their burials, remember. So they, David and his men went back into this pretty good-sized cave and went back into the recesses of the cave, and they're just in there. And we go to En Gedi, we see the caves all over the place. There's tons of caves there. Well, Saul is with his men, and he's got to go. He says, excuse me, guys, I'm going to tend to my business here for a second. So he goes into a cave. Of all the caves there, Saul goes into the cave where David and his men are hiding back in the recesses of the cave. You remember. And as he squats down to do what he needs to do, David's men are on David. They say, whoa, David, God brought Saul all by himself right into our cave. We have literally caught Saul. <laughs> I didn't say that. You said that. I did not say that. But they, he did. And there they are. And they're like, oh man. David, take him out. This is it. This is it. Can you imagine the excitement? David sneaks on up to Saul. But instead of killing Saul, he says, how can I do this? This is God's king for the moment. God has put him on the throne. So he just cut off a bit of his robe that had been dropped down a bit. And he crawled back out. Saul didn't have a clue. We talked about the robe, the robe being that symbol of monarchy. So by cutting that robe, he has humiliated Saul, but he's also said, <laughs> that robe really is mine. Saul gets up, walks out of the cave, goes down to his men. David comes out of that cave. Can you imagine Saul's shock? He says, King Saul, I got a piece of your robe. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want your kingdom. Saul breaks. He says, David, you're more righteous than I am. Come on back home. Come back to the palace. 
David said, I'm good. <laughs> He's had the spirit chucked at him all the time. Remember, Saul was not spirit led. He wanted David's spirit, or he wanted to spear David dead. And David's not dumb. He says, I'll stay out here, see you bye. And Saul goes back home. But David passed the test. His flesh would have said, I can take it and I can take it now. But David, being led by the Spirit, says, no, in God's time. God will give me what he's going to give me in his time. I will wait. I will be patient. Now we come to chapter 25. And in chapter 25, the first verse is like, what? Then Samuel died. And the Israelites gathered together and lamented for him and buried him at his home in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Well, it's interesting, that word for died right there, it's moan, or moan, in the Hebrew, and it means to die peacefully at an old age from natural causes. It's the way all of us think we're going to die. You know, we're all going to die. I'm going to die of old age at around 247 years old or so. <laughs> you know, we all think that. We're just going to live for... We're dead. Come on. But that's how Samuel dies. He dies peacefully of natural causes at an old age. Genesis chapter 25, verse 8 said Abraham did that. And there are many instances, instances in the scriptures of dying like this. Samuel dies like that. He died. And the Israelites gathered together and lamented for him. Interesting, not Saul, probably. Remember Saul and Samuel have been estranged for seven years now. And there's no mention of Saul. Most people believe, no, Saul wasn't part of that group. And they buried him at his home in Ramah. The word buried is an interesting word there. And we've talked about the Jewish burial customs. For those of you who don't know, I was in funeral service for a number of years. Had to study burial customs from around the world. And even today, uh, the Hebrew people have a very distinct burial custom. But in scripture, in biblical times, their burial customs are much different than what ours are today. Ours follow more the Egyptian burial uh, practices. Dr. Robert Holmes, you know, and the, no, you don't know, but trust me, he did. He, he brought embalming to the United States back in the 1800s. President Lincoln, the first president of who's ever embalmed. Who cares? It's just stuff that you have to learn. I put it out there. But at any rate, the Jewish burial methods are so much different. To the Jews, they did not embalm, apart from Jacob and Joseph were embalmed there in Egypt and all, but they would take the body and place it in a cave or an above-ground tomb. They would wrap the body, leaving the face exposed, like a mummy with the face exposed and a little linen hat wrapped around their head. They put spices within the wrappings so that the stench of decomposition would not be overwhelming. And they would leave the body in the cave for an extended period of time. Then after the decomposition has taken place and there was basically some hair and the skeletal remains, they would go back in and they would take the bones of the person and put them in a box called an ossuary. And they would place the longest bone, the femur, you know, in the box and the other femur in the box and they had a way of stacking all 206 bones in that box and then they would close the box. If you were wealthy, you'd have a fancy old box made of marble and be all engraved on there. And that ossuary then would stay in that decomposition cave. That was your tomb. That was the family tomb. So you'd have an ossuary of grandpa and of grandma and of the cousins and of the wife. And then your ossuary would be ready to go. So when you die, you could, they would do that. Or after you die, sometimes they'd make it. But that's how people were buried in biblical terms. So when it says buried here, it's an interesting word because that literally means entombed. It says Jesus was crucified and buried. The word actually means entombed. Where they would place them in a decomposition tomb, let the decomposition take place. That is why I remember when John went to the tomb of Lazarus, his friend, on the fourth day, remember Martha said, well, it's the fourth day his body... In the old King James, it's the best. It stinketh. <laughs> Those of you that raise boys as they get older. <laughs> Febreze in the bedroom. <laughs> because we as young boys tend to, not yet, but it's coming, it's coming. 
All of a sudden, as you become a man, you start to stinketh a little bit. <laughs> and flesh stinks. We know that. We know flesh stinks. That's why we have deodorant. <laughs> and we're in the flesh. We know we're in the flesh because we start to stink a little bit, spiritually speaking as well. And we try our spiritual deodorant to try and cover the stink of our flesh. We call it going to church. <laughs> well, I'm going to church, so I'm good now. Now, going to church, you're still a stinking sinner. <laughs> And going to church doesn't forgive your sins. It's only the blood of Jesus that washes us clean. Amen. Pastor Anthony and I is going to be talking about baptism. I'm not going to touch that. I'll let you handle that. But it's, uh, baptism doesn't wash us. It's the blood of Jesus that washes us. That's how we get clean. Well, there's this stinketh thing in the tomb and all. Well, that's what's going on here. Samuel dies. It's a peaceful death at an old age, according to that word. And the Israelites gathered together. They all gathered together. It's a national thing that represents from every tribe. Anybody who's anybody apart from Saul and his group are at that funeral or that memorial service, if you will. And they buried him. They entombed him at his home in Ramah. So he's got his home there in Ramah, and they've got an above-ground tomb, according to Jewish tradition, where the body of Samuel was placed. As I went through the scripture looking for people that we are familiar with in the Old Testament that were entombed, I came across like almost 47 of them mentioned in scripture or Jewish tradition where they said this is where it is. Abraham entombed in the cave of Machpelah. Isaac there. Jacob dying in Egypt in Balm, but brought back to the cave of Machpelah. Joseph brought back in Balm, but brought back. Caleb in a tomb, Joshua in a tomb, Samuel here in a tomb, David in a tomb. And it goes on and on and on and on. That's what happened here to Samuel. So when you see buried, he had an above-ground tomb somewhere. He's placed in there. They have this. Samuel now off the scene. He will be mentioned again in chapter 28. Those of you that are into seances will be covering seances in 1 Samuel 28 as Saul, godly man that he is, decides to go to a medium and see if he can't conjure up the spirit of Samuel. And of course the debate is, was it Samuel? Was it a spirit masquerading as Samuel and all that? And come here for the study of the 28th. We'll talk about it, but it's kind of cool. <laughs> so Samuel goes off the pages of scripture now. We saw him starting off, remember, in chapter 1. Here in chapter 25, he leaves. Samuel is one of the main players in all of Jewish history. He was the man that gently took the nation of Israel from being all messed up in the period of the judges and all and brought them together now all the way to the anointing, finally, of King David. There's Samuel. But now we get into the rest of chapter 25, and this is, for those of you that are old, this chapter is a hoot. <laughs> those of you who are young, just forget I even said that because it means nothing to you, but this is a crazy chapter right here. This is crazy. Let's take a look at this. Now, there was a man in Maon. Now, remember up in verse 1, it said he went down to the wilderness of Paran? And uh, many of the translations have Maon there, and there's a question of where that is, but, or, or which one is correct, but now... Most people believe that the Peron and the New King James would have been better translated Maon, whatever, they're close. But there was a man in Maon, where David is, whose business was in Carmel. When we go to Israel, remember we go to Mount Carmel up north? That's not this Carmel. This is a little Carmel, a little village known as Carmel, down here by Maon. I sat in a study one time where uh, the, the, it was a home Bible study, and he hadn't studied that. And he said, so old... Uh, I lost his name, Nabal. <laughs> it is. So old Nabal would go all the way up to Carmel with thousands of sheep to shear him and then come all the way back down. And everyone says, oh, they wrote down. Man, come on. Just look at a map. Carmel is about four miles from Mahan. Just call him yourself. So maps are important. Clesson, keep teaching those maps. I know you are. Keep doing it. You're doing an Oh, it's awesome. Learn maps. If James, oh, he is in here. James, how are maps? Awesome. James has got the biggest testimony I've ever heard on maps. James is saying, you know, I didn't even, we were doing maps in an Old Testament survey class, and you, you come every week just more fired up. So James runs the kids' ministry, so if you have kids in kids' ministry, you know your kids are learning maps. Because maps completely shed light on the Word of God. And you don't have to get all weird, just look at a map. Hello. But here it is. So now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel, just outside of town. Small little town there. And the man was rich. Is that what it says? Very rich. Very rich. Can you imagine? This is, rich is good. Very rich. That's pretty good. And when God's word says you're rich, that's good. When God's word says you're very rich, you got, you got, you're rich. 
very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. Those of you that go to Israel, you, we see the shepherds coming into Jerusalem sometime with their, their sheep and their goats, and you'll see that little flock. They might have 12. But it's crazy, a stoplight. Car's going by, and there's a shepherd with his sheep. This is the weirdest thing you ever wanted to see. He had 4,000. A wealthy dude. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Do you know what you do with the wool once you shear it? Is that, is that like harvest time for a shepherd? Uh, yeah. So this is money time right now. He's very wealthy, and it's payday. So he has got 4,000 sheep goats that he is shearing right now. And he was shearing a sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal. Now we want to keep our, our eye we want to keep our eye on that. Oh, she didn't make it. Okay. But the name was Nabal. And we want to keep our eye on this guy because as we look, we already know now he's rich. We know that. Let's see what it says. He was shearing sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal. The name of his wife was Abigail. So we got this couple, Nabal and Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding. That's cool. It's cool to have a wife who has good understanding. And beautiful appearance. Only two other women in scripture are, are described that way, Rachel and Esther. So Abigail's in good company. Rachel, Abigail, Esther. The three women that are said to be of beautiful appearance. So she's got good understanding and she's good to look at too. Nabal is a fortunate man. He's got a wife. But the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. Interestingly enough, Caleb means dog. And back in this day, dogs were not the cute little things that we groom and take care of and sit on our lap. Back in this day, it would be like saying rat. And he lived up to his name. And it's amazing to me that we have this Nabal that we're going to be looking at who is really, uh, 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 man, this guy is crazy. He's a horrible man, a horrible man. And he's got this awesome wife. And the question is, how can this godly woman, beautiful godly woman, how in the world did she get married to this guy? How did he get that? Any idea? Oh, yeah, bam. Hello, hasn't changed, huh? Hasn't changed even a little bit. Yeah, it was money. She married money, not the man. And there are far too many godly Christian women that fall in that same trap. If you're not a Christian, if you're going to hell anyway, you might as well marry the money. You might as well enjoy life. You're going to spend eternity in hell. You might as well have some fun while you're here, I guess. I don't know. But if you're a Christian, what in the world are we doing? What if we stink it? I'm sorry? What if we stink it? Exactly. That's money. You know, that's what it is. So she marries this dude, and he's walking around this beautiful wife who is a classy woman. She is full of understanding. And here he is because he's got money. He's all that. That's Nabal. You can't help but wonder, like us to turn, we don't do this very often. If you're new here, we're going to turn to the Gospel of Luke, and this is not meant to put anybody down. Just when I became a Christian, I was in a Bible study, and they were turning all over the Bible. I had no idea where they were talking about. So we're going to go to the Gospel of Luke. Now, Luke is in the back part of the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you're sitting by someone who is kind of saying, they have that look like, I can't find it, that's no big thing. It's okay. Just reach over and help them find it. But we want to find Luke chapter 12 because is it possible? Is it possible? You know, Jesus always gave parables to which people could relate. And this story we're reading about David, remember, King David is the man in Judaism at the time of Jesus. Everyone knows about King David. They know his story. And now he's going to give a parable. Is it possible that Jesus, he gave this parable, many people related right back to to Nabal. Let's take a look and see. Verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus says, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware. Wow, isn't that something? Take heed and beware of covetousness. 
For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he gives a parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? That's the end of the parable. Then Jesus looks at this crowd and he says, So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. He's a fool. Why is that significant? Because the word Nabal literally means fool. Isn't that something? So when Jesus gives this parable, in Hebrew, he would have literally said, but God said to him in verse 20, Nabal. Can you imagine? It's like, oh, hello. We know about Nabal. So let's go back to the fool back here in chapter 25 of 1 Samuel. We're going to read it one more time just so we get a picture of this guy before we go on. Now there was... A man in Moan whose business was in Carmel, the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing the sheep in Carmel. Okay, we got it. It's, it's money time. The name of the man was Fool. The name of his wife, Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding, beautiful appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. He was doggish. He was a rat, so to speak. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, we're going to see why. David sent ten young men. He sent ten young men to this man. And David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. He knows who I am. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you, peace to your house. And peace to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shearers. Your shepherds were with us. We're out here in the wilderness. We know you have shepherds with all these 4,000 sheep. We were out here with them. We did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them all the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men. They'll tell you. No sheep rustlers got to any of your 4,000 sheep when me and my men were here. We gave you protection. We didn't take one little lamb for a little mutton dinner. We just protected your investment. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we're coming on a feast day. You're sharing. You're partying. You've had a good year. You've had no losses. No animals got to your sheep. No rustlers got to your sheep. It was custom in the day when you provided protection that your needs would be met. We have not done that. We have not had any of our needs met. We have a need. So here we are. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes. We protected your young men. Now let my young men find favor in your eyes. For we have come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son, David. Not extortion, protection. We have a need out here now. You have more than enough. You have what to eat. We don't. Give us what you'd like. That's for you guys. <laughs> Give us what you would feel is right to give us. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal. According to all these words in the name of David, and they waited. Then Nabal answered David's servants, and he said, Who is David? Who's this? There's that term, son of Jesse. He's been watching the news channels. <laughs> He's just blurting out everything he hears. 
Remember Saul called David the son of Jesse? It was a derogatory term. David, the next king, I don't think so. He's the son of a, 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 a simple little shepherd. Come on. He's the son of Jesse. He's nothing. We wouldn't even call him by his name. Well, now Nabal does the same thing. Who is this son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each from his master. He's on the run from Saul. Shall I then take notice the possessive pronouns here? Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shares and give it to men when I do not know where they're even from? We see Nabal's mistake. My bread, my water, my meat, my shares. No. That's what God has given you. It tells us in Deuteronomy, God gives the ability to create wealth. Nabal, you think it's all you. It's not you, Nabal. You're a fool. You're living up to your name. You somehow think because you've got 4,000 sheep that you're better than Jesse? Because he's got 12 sheep? Or whatever he had? Really? And it's your bread, it's your water. No, 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 no. These are things God gives us to share with others. God does not give wealth so that we can walk around saying, look how much I have. We're not to hoard up money. We're to use money to reach others for Christ. Jesus gives a parable about that. He says the people of the world are wise with their money. You be wise with what God has given you to reach others for eternity. It's not to store up. It's to invest in the souls of other people. It's not enough just to meet the needs of the homeless if all we do is give them food and clothing and a place to stay. If they don't know about Jesus, they're just going to go to hell with full tummies. Amen. We've got to tell them about Jesus. It's more than that. But how can we, the book of James says, tell them about Jesus if their stomachs are, are empty? How can we bring them here and tell them about Jesus and God loves you and meet your needs? Where are you sleeping tonight? I don't know. I think behind that tree over there. Well, God bless you. See you next week. That is not Christian. That is baloney. We're to meet people's needs. We're to use what God has given us to further the kingdom of God. Not to hoard it up for ourselves. That's what a fool does. That's what Nabal does. And what does Nabal say in his heart according to the Bible? Nabal says in his heart, there is no God. And if there is no God, then I've got to hoard up my money. Who's going to take care of me if I don't? So David's young men turned on their heels and they went back. And they came and told him all these words. Now David had just passed one of the biggest tests of his life. The king of Israel was in the cave. <coughs> David and his men are in that same cave. David can take him out. And he doesn't. He says, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to wait for God. Passed a big test. Anybody here ever passed a big test in your walk? Can I just see you say, I had a big test. I actually passed it. Anybody? Please. That's it? Four of all four people passed a big test. That's good. <laughs> Whew. Let's try it again. Anybody ever passed a test in your life? Let's see. Okay. Okay, that's better. Whew. Come on now. So, we pass big tests. And it's like, it's an awesome feeling, isn't it? When you know you said no to your flesh, you passed the test. Most dangerous time of your life right there. You passed the big test. The big tests are very seldom the cause of believers leaving the Lord. It's a series, Pastor Anthony was telling me this morning, I was going through some of this with him this morning, and I said, you know, it's so cool because, and I'm saying this big test, and now he's going to fail in a little test, and it's like crazy, and it's the little things, and I said over in, first, in, in the Song of Solomon, in chapter 2, verse 15, Solomon writes, and he says, it's beware of the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's not the big fox, it's the little foxes that get the vine. It's the little thing, repeatedly, gets it, and Anthony goes, of course, of course he's going to say this. Well, C.S. Lewis says. Anthony is a C.S. Lewis guru, man. You want to know anything about C.S. Lewis, talk to Pastor Anthony. He reads C.S. Lewis like all the time. And he gave this wonderful quote, and it's exactly the same thing. So C.S. Lewis says something really cool. If you want to know what it is, talk to Pastor Anthony because it's cool, <laughs> but it's awesome. But it's that same principle that it's not the big thing where we fail and leave the Lord. It's a series of little mistakes 
giving into our flesh just a little bit, just a little bit at a time. And now David, he sends his guys, we need some food. Man, they're shearing up there, we've been protecting the sheep. Guys, go up there and just tell them, tell them you're with me. Let's get some meat. They come back, and they came, they told David everything he said. David's response, he's got that short fuse still. He's David, but he's not perfect. Well, let's go kill him. <laughs> what? Yeah, we're going to kill him. And we'll kill all his people too. We'll just kill them all. That'll teach him. Remember he's on the throne and Nathan con confronts him with that parable? If not, we'll get there in a couple months. But he talks about a guy with all the sheep again. He's got some company coming and he He's got to kill a sheep for dinner. He said, oh, don't kill one of my many sheep. My neighbor's got that one sheep over there. And that sheep's spoiled, man. He, he eats with him, sleeps with him. He's like a pet. Go get that sheep and kill that one. Let's eat him instead. So he went and got the sheep and killed him. And David's the king hearing that. What? Well, kill him. Now that's extreme. Killing the man for killing the pet is extreme. It's a horrible thing, but that's extreme. But David is so guilty. Nathan looks, he says, David, you're the man. God has given you everything. Uriah had one thing, his wife Bathsheba. You took her. But it's amazing when we're guilty how quick we are to judge, isn't it? If you're judging, check your own life because there's something going on in there. David was guilty and he was quick to judge. When we receive grace and we're living in grace, we're quick to give grace. Well, David right now is going to mess up in a very small test. The test is, can I have some food? No! I'm going to kill you now. That's what he does. So David said to his men, every man gird on his sword. So every man girded on his sword. David also girded on his sword. I'm going to be part of this. I'm killing him too. And about 400 men went with David. 200 stayed with the supplies. David in his flesh. David's on his way to teach this man not to say no to David. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, and you can turn there if you want. I'm going to read it very quickly. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, it says this, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You disrespect me, I'm going to disrespect you. That's how Jesse brought me up, David would say. He's in his flesh. But I tell you, Jesus says, not to resist an evil person. Whoa, wait a minute now. Read that again. This is Jesus talking. What? I tell you not to resist an evil person. We're not talking about another brother in the Lord. We're not talking about, well, he offended me. I just got to forgive him. Turn the other no, we're talking an evil person that wants to take you out. Not to resist an evil person. Think about that. In the land of machismo, that is not cool. You know. This is machismo. You give me a chin up, I'm going to take you out. But that's not the way of Jesus. That's the way of the world. That's the way of the world. Jesus says, I tell you not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, they hit you. Turn the other to him also. What? And we think we're all that. There's the mark of a true follower of Christ. Isn't that something? Just a second, sweetie, just a second. Isn't that something? If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, give him your cloak too. I'm going to sue you. For what? I'm going to sue you for $1,000. Well, here, here's 5000 Calm yourself. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. I need you to work next to three hours on Saturday. I'll work eight. You can give another guy off. Don't have to call everybody in. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Because it's not about stuff. That's the way of Jesus. Completely contrary to what the world tells us. So here's David. 
He's in his flesh. Not doing the best. He showed great wisdom in sparing Saul. He's in his flesh now. The little foxes. Beware of little foxes, guys. Little things that'll take us away from the Lord. Little things. You know, I don't really need to have time in the Word. I've been a Christian for a long time now. It's been like eight months. I get it. I got it. Or eight years. Or eight decades. Whatever it might be. It makes no difference. We're not there. I'm still a baby Christian trying to grow. Trying to get it. Just trying to get it. But the little fox says, oh, I've, I've matured past that. I don't really need that anymore. You can wear the little fox. I don't really need fellowship. Not important. The little fox says it'll eat away at the vine. Now, one of the young men told Abigail, remember she's a woman of understanding, one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. That means he spoke badly, rudely, condescendingly. Nabal's been doing it all of his life. He's got 4,000 sheep. What? He spoke rough to them. He was not gracious to them. He reviled them. But the men were very good to us. These were good people. We were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in the fields. They were a wall to us, both by night and day, all the time we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what you will do, this young man says to Abigail, for harm is determined against our master and against all of his household. For he is such a scoundrel. <laughs> Literally a son of Belial. He's a fool and a child of the devil, this man. He's a scoundrel. Today we'd call him a good businessman. <laughs> I'm just saying, we would. He's got 4,000 sheep. He's good, and he doesn't take no from nobody. He's a scoundrel. For he is such a scoundrel that one cannot speak to him. Nabal knows it all. We can't even make an appeal to him. He's living up to his name. He's Nabal. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, fine sheep already dressed, five seas of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs, loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, Go on before me. See, I'm coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. So it was as she rode on the donkey that she went down under cover of the hill. And there were David and his men coming down toward her. And she met them. Now they're coming with blood in their eyes. They're coming to take out Nabal in this group. And here comes Abigail with her gift. Now David had said, Surely in vain I have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him. And he has repaid me evil for good. Is that a true statement? It is a true statement. He had his facts right, but his heart wasn't right. And that is oftentimes the case, is it not, in our relationship with other people. We get the facts right, but our heart's not right. The facts are straight, our heart's not straight. We try to strike out for vengeance. He's repaid me evil for good. May God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. Whoa, man. Now, when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. We're starting to see her humility now. And she fell at his feet and said, on me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Please let not my Lord regard <laughs> the scoundrel Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. Notice what she says. God is stopping you right now, David. I'm here. God is stopping you from doing something foolish. Notice what she says. And now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant. For the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. 
Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. Saul's chasing you, but God's got you. Check this out. And the lives of your enemies shall be sling, he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. Old Abigail really has understanding. She knows his destiny, but she also knows his history. She says, I know about Goliath. Remember, David? God had you with Goliath. Remember that sling? God's got a great plan for you, David. Yeah, Saul's chasing you, but God's got you. He's had you in the past. He's got you in the future. Don't do something now, David, that's going to come back and be a, a scar on you when you become the king of Israel. You're about to do something that's going to come back and expose the weakness of your character if you keep this up. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and he has appointed you ruler over Israel. That's coming. That this will be no grief to you. There it is. It won't, it won't be something that you're going to have to say, oh man, we've got to figure out a way to get around this. He says, don't do it, David. Don't do it. You're much bigger than this. What God has for you is much bigger than a meal from a fool. Nor offense to heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. You're going to get, you're going to, you're going to make it. And when you make it, David, remember me. David, God used me. Isn't that something? Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Man, David. Some woman comes and says that to him. David sees the hand of God. He realizes God is speaking to me through this woman. That's amazing. When we look at her, we see that she speaks from submission. She humbles herself. She's married to a very wealthy man, but she humbles herself before David. And she speaks sweetly from submission. She understands her role, but she speaks, speaks sweetly. God's got a plan for you, David. Don't do this. God's going to use you, and this will be a mark on you. Don't do this, David. Speak sweetly to him from submission. And that is the key, is speaking sweetly from a position of submission. Submission does not mean less than. It means you're coming under a God-given authority. But speak sweetly from that position. Don't speak silently. Well, I'm just to submit and be quiet and my opinion doesn't matter. No, your opinion matters big time. God speaks through you. Ladies, in your marriage, God speaks through you. Don't be speaking silently. I don't say nothing. And don't be speaking sharply. They call that nagging. <laughs> We have a phrase in America, well, we know who wears the pants in that family. <coughs> Don't be that. That comes from speaking sharply, telling your husband what to do. Well, because he's a fool. Well, this guy really is a fool right here. He's a big time fool. But you speak to authority sweetly. Amen. Not silently, not sharply. And David responds, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me, and blessed is your advice, and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light no males would have been left to Nabal. Abigail, like Esther, has been used by God to alter the course of history right here. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice and respected your person. Now Abigail went to Nabal. Now if she had been speaking sharply, if she was one of those wives that does wear the pants, could you imagine what she'd be saying to him right now? You idiot. I just saved your life. <laughs> yeah. Nabal, being a fool, had no clue how close he was to death. He was just partying over the successful shearing season. 
Now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was holding a feast. The word feast, there's a drinking feast, of course. In his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was drunk. Is that what it says? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he had dropped down drunk, man. He was very drunk. He was out there. <laughs> Therefore she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light. If you talk to someone who's drunk, you're wasting your time and theirs. So it was in the morning, when the wine had gone from Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him. He was coming to kill me. What a picture of a fool, though. So close to death, had no idea that death was on his doorstep, and he was just partying away. Didn't have a clue. Now he sobers up. She tells him his heart died within him. He became like a stone. A lot of folks uh, believe that he had a stroke right there. Who knows? Then it happened. After about 10 days, David didn't strike him. The Lord struck Nabal. And he died. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. That's not our calling. Calm yourself. So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord. Nabal's dead. Praise God. (laughs) I grew up in a small little town, 500 people funeral home was in that town. We had these little towns seven miles, five miles apart. One town had a lawyer. One town had a doctor. One town had a dentist. We had a dentist in our town too for a while, but well, we still do. We did. But our town was the funeral home town. And then there's all these farms up in Minnesota real close by each other because the land is so black. The earth is so black that 120 acres, you're, you're good to go. So the farms are close by. So there's population, but the towns are just small. They're just grain elevators, a couple of restaurants. And then one town has a funeral home, one town, you know. Well, we were the funeral home. My dad managed that funeral home in that town. The man before him, I won't say his name, it's not important, but dad was young when you moved there, 24, something like that, 23, 24. 26, 24. Yeah, so young, young guy. And his boss is there. His boss was raising a couple of kids. One of the kids, I'm just going on the side note here to someone dies, you say, praise God, really. But... They had show and tell. Small town, 500 people. Show and tell. 12 kids in a class, 13 kids in a class. I don't know if it was a little boy or a little girl. One of them stood up. What do you have for show and tell? We're very excited. My dad, the funeral director, my dad said, if we get two more people dying this month, we get to go to Disneyland. <laughs> so she would have been the one that said, someone died? Praise God! So there are times you understand that you might say that. You might say that. But (laughs) Nabal dies, and David says, Praise God. Couldn't ask him. Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and has kept his servant from evil, for the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head. There you go, Nabal. That'll teach you. Basically is what he's saying. And David sent, what now? and proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife. Abigail, good understanding, beautiful appearance, humble, speaks sweetly from a point of submission. David sees that, said, you're available. When the servants of David had come to Abigail Carmel, they spoke to her saving, saying, David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. Now, I would not suggest that as a way to ask your girl to marry you. (laughs) You know, have your employees say, hey, go tell her I'll marry her if she wants me. (laughs) Don't do that. Be romantic. It's okay to be romantic. Get down on your knee and, and ask her. It's all right to do that. Be a man. Don't be a jerk. Be a man. Be nice to your wife. Then she arose, bowed her face to the earth, and said, Here is your maidservant. Check this out. Now remember, she is a widow of 4,000, a man who owned 4,000 sheep and goats. She's a wealthy lady. And now David, who she knows will be the next king of Israel, is proposing to her. 
She says, here's your maidservant, a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. She humbles herself even under the people that come and are used by David to propose to her. So Abigail arose in haste and rode on a donkey, attended by five of her, her maidens. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, so both of them were his wives. Verse 44. But David had given, but Saul had given Michael, that's his, his wife, remember, that had rescued him and then he left, remember, on, on the run. While he's gone, Saul takes his daughter, David's wife, and he gives her to Palti, the son of Laish, who was from Galim. So Abigail, David has no wife right now. His wife's been given away. So Abigail actually becomes the second first wife of David here. But Ahinoam, there's just no excuse for that. I would love to have one. They're not there. It's just not there. Ahinoam is going to have a little boy. His name's going to be Amnon. Amnon is going to be the one who brings murder and intrigue into the family of David. It's going to take a long time for this to come to fruition. It's going to look like God just kind of looked the other way. But the consequences of his decision here is going to come back and bite him big time. And um, God's going to use the fruit of Ahinoam to bring the sword into David's family. So chapter 25 is not one of David's best chapters. He's in his flesh. He's doing some crazy things. The little fox got him. But God's still going to use him. We're going to see God's going to forgive him, restore him. God does not use perfect people. David has a heart after God. God does not look at the outside of man. He looks at the heart. So you might be sitting here today saying, God knows your heart. He knows your heart. I want to just encourage you today. Make certain your heart is clean before God. Don't let the little foxes draw you away. Little decisions, little decisions will lead us away. The book of Hebrews is all about drifting, the first couple chapters. It's about drifting away from the Lord. I don't know of anybody I've ever met or talked with who has said, Pastor, I talked to you and say, what happened? Well, I got up and I decided just I'm going to drift away from the Lord today. <laughs> no one ever makes that decision. It just kind of starts to happen by making little poor decisions, not making the best decision. And it just, you start to drift. We just start to drift. If you've been drifting, I'm going to tell you God knows you. He knows your heart. And our God is a loving God, a God full of mercy and grace, a God who is quick to forgive, a God who loves you. It's just a matter of us saying, God, I drifted. That secret sin that nobody knows, when you confess that to God, he's not going to go, what? I didn't expect that from you. That secret sin, he knows all about it. You're not hiding anything from God. He knows our thoughts and the intents. He knows us. So it's a matter of us of just swallowing our pride and confessing our sin to the Lord. Say, God, I drifted, I did this, I whatever. Who cares? It's between you and God. We get right with him. Receive the love, the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness of God. Stay close to him. Don't play the fool. Invest in things that have eternal, of an eternal nature. Invest who you are into the kingdom of God. Last week, Pastor Anthony was talking about serving. Before the service, Tom got up and talked about serving. I listened to all the teachings. Everybody was talking about serving. So I think that's a good idea. We should serve. Serve the body. Serve the non-body. Serve the not-body yet. Just serve folk. 
invest in people. But first, we've got to get right. So let's get right. Let's worship. Tonight, we're in Acts chapter 22. It is an amazing chapter. Let's enjoy the Word of God tonight, 630. We'll have sweet worship. Thank you, by the way, Randy Lennon Berger and David and Isaac. Thank you for worship leading today. It was excellent. Thank you. And we'll have more worship tonight. Let's enjoy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for this glimpse into a failed test of David. God, it thrills my heart to see even men that you use in such a mighty way that they're not perfect. It gives me hope. God, that you use people who fail tests. But God, help us not to use a failed test as an excuse not to be used. God, help us to, right now, to spend a moment with you, with our Heavenly Father, confessing our sin to you. Jesus, thank you so much for loving us. Lord, we revel in your resurrection. Lord, that you would come to earth and live a perfect, sin-free life. That you willingly would lay down your life through the horrors of a crucifixion. Because you love us. That you'd be willing to shed your blood that our sins might be forgiven and remembered no more. We thank you for that new covenant. Lord, our expectant belief, our hope, is in your death and your resurrection. We thank you, Lord, that we serve a living God, a risen Savior, one who has told us in the scriptures that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we thank you for that verse. We confess. We purpose to repent, to turn, and to receive your forgiveness, Lord. You tell us in your word that if we draw near to you, you'll draw near to us. As we turn, Lord, back to you, we thank you for those open arms that embrace us, that hold us, that love us. We bask in your love. You are so good. God, help us to share your love with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's